Thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's presentation by Dr. Gavin Slade, criminologist and lecturer at the Center for Russian, Central, and East European Studies at the University of Glasgow. He'll speak to us today on good governance, prison gangs, and informal order in the former Soviet Union. I'm Bill Reisinger, a member of the board of the ICFRC. I'll be hosting today's program. I'm pleased to announce that 2018 is our 35th anniversary for hosting community luncheon forums to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, sponsors, and interns for making these forums possible since the year when Lotus 123 was released in 1983. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I also thank today's special sponsors, John Menninger and Mike Carberry. Thanks also to City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2, and to the U of I Library's digital archives. Introducing our speaker today will be Professor Marina Zaloznaya of the U of I Department of Sociology. Marina is one of that discipline's leading scholars on corruption in post-communist Europe and on organizational and economic crime more generally. Many of you will recall that she and I presented results from our joint work to this council in September of 2016. We appreciate her help in arranging for today's talk by Dr. Slade. Thank you, Bill, and good afternoon. Welcome. I am honored to present today's speaker. Dr. Gavin Slade is a lecturer at the Center for Russian Central and East European Studies at the University of Glasgow. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this system, in American educational system, his position would uh, be equivalent to an assistant professor. <clears throat> Dr. Slade's research focuses on organized crime, policing, prison reform, and the politics of crime in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Gavin got his PhD from Oxford University in 2012. He then worked at Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia, and held a postdoctoral research position at the University of Toronto in Canada. Directly prior to coming to Glasgow, Dr. Slade was a research fellow at the Freie University in Berlin. His first book, Reorganizing Crime, Mafia, and Anti-Mafia in Post-Soviet Georgia, was published by Oxford University Press in 2013. Gavin's current work, based on surveys and interviews with prisoners, focuses on penal reform targeting prison gang structures in Georgian, Lithuanian, Kyrgyz, and Moldovan prisons. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gavin Slade. Well, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Bill and Marina for organizing this. Um, we had Marina over in, in Glasgow. She gave a little talk uh, about corruption in Ukraine and Belarus uh, for us, which I think everyone really enjoyed. So that was really great. And it's really nice to have a sort of reciprocal coming and going between Iowa and Scotland. Um, so I'll talk about this issue of, of prison gangs. I've changed the title slightly for the, for the, for the PowerPoint there. So I'll put a little question mark next to good governance because I think that's probably more appropriate because uh, that's sort of the, the, the issue that I'll be, I'll be addressing is, is whether we see governance by gang structures that actually provides uh, public goods to prisoners or not. Um, so I'll sort of delve into this very murky world of organized crime, prison gangs in the former Soviet Union. I'll try my best not to put you off your, your dinners when I'm doing that. Um, it's, it's not the nicest topic, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, the central questions do revolve around things like violence and, and so on, but hopefully you'll stick with me um, as we go through. Okay, so I'll um, just give a very quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, I want to sort of discuss the link between organized crime and uh, the prison systems of the former Soviet Union. Um, so sort of basically how, how we get from the discussion of organized crime to a discussion around prison reform. I mean, what would link those two things? 
Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the, the central sort of questions that I want to try to produce a tentative answer to by the time I've finished speaking. Hopefully I'll get there. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe you guys could also think of your own answers to some of the questions I'm posing and write them down on those little notes, as Bill mentioned. <laughs> Um, because <laughs> there isn't really, I don't really have a definitive answer. I just, I'm going to suggest certain answers to the, the questions I pose. Um, basically, the central issue is going to revolve around how we understand resistance amongst prisoners to reform projects that are going on in the former Soviet Union that attempt to supposedly create better prisons. Um, and then trying to explain this resistance with this sort of question of, well, is it, do people resist attempts at reform that target gangs and informal structures amongst prisoners because those gangs actually produce governance for the, the prisoners involved and that's why they, they resist reform. Um, so that's the sort of the sort of question, the big question that I'm, I'm going to be asking. Okay, so just that first issue of going from um, organised crime to prison, uh, this is really my own little personal story in a way of how I ended up looking at prison reform. Uh, so this is a photograph of a huge poster that was in central Tbilisi, that's in Georgia, in the South Caucasus region, uh, which is all about a sort of uh, yeah, a campaign promise that was made by the government there in 2006, 2007. Uh, this is the Saakashvili government, the United National Movement government um, in Georgia that was basically promising to wipe out or remove the mafia from Georgia. Um, and so this, this poster basically shows all of these different mafia bosses in prison or with their, their sort of faces blurred out. And the, the, the poster basically says, you know, promises delivered a Georgia without organized criminals or a Georgia without um, uh, mafiosi. So I was interested in this issue, that was what my PhD was all about, was about sort of anti-mafia in Georgia, how they dealt with the problem of organised crime there. And one of the most curious aspects of the anti-mafia policy in Georgia was that a big central part of it was all about reform in prison, uh, which isn't what you would ordinarily think would be involved in an anti-organised crime campaign. Right? So there's a curious issue there of how do we explain that? Why would prison reform be such a key element to... Uh, anti-organised crime in the region. And that was sort of the, the little spark or when the, you know, the light bulb sort of went on above my head. I thought, well, that, that would make a great uh, follow-up project would be to look at the central issue of prison reform as part of anti-organised crime. So uh, what is the link between organised crime and prisons in the former Soviet Union? I think to discuss that, uh, we need to think a lot about the history of the prison system in the Soviet period uh, and how organised crime came to be framed by certain subcultural norms that grew out of the gulag, so the huge system of camps in the Soviet Union. Um, so basically, the idea here is that prisons in the Soviet Union were not like prisons that we might think of in the UK or the US. We're talking about really big areas, big spatial um, zones in which people lived very collectively. So the philosophy of punishment was very different from what we might see in the US where punishment is very much a, about individualization, putting people in cells, separating out. In the Soviet Union, the philosophy of punishment was much more about putting people into these big barracks, into these big, what were known as colonies. Um, so I might use that term now and again, but what I'm really referring to, a sort of a, a barrack system of collectivist punishment. So what we see in those big spaces is, of course, a huge governance problem for the prison guards and for the formal structures that should be trying to control that system, right? So if you put lots and lots of people all in a big sort of uh, space in which the prison guards are not really very present, then we start to actually see self-governance structures emerge amongst the prisoners themselves. So instead of relying on the guards to, to produce governance for the prisoners, resolve disputes, um, distribute resources, prisoners start to do it for themselves. So what we end up with is a really highly developed prisoner subculture that has all sorts of informal in institutions that helps prisoners collect money together, redistribute resources, whether someone's got some sausage or someone's got some tea, who gets what. Uh, if, somebody, if two people have a dispute, how you resolve that dispute. So what we see is really highly developed informal institutions that involve hierarchies, where we have sort of bosses at the top, uh, then folk underneath the bosses that sort of oversee and, and collect resources from the prisoners. 
Uh, and we see this sort of uh, institutionalized in practices, particular types of practices. You know, so we sort of see an informal uh, system of courts in which people sit and, dis dis and if there's a dispute, they, they resolve those disputes amongst themselves. Um, so what we see is basically self-governance. Now, at this point, some of that self-governance within the prison system could be utilised for the purposes of organised crime outside the prison system. Because what we have is basically a, a self-organising system that, of course, is still based on violence and the monopolisation of violence by certain elite criminals, uh, which is mentioned in a number of memoirs, if you read uh, Solzhenitsyn and Shalamov, they, they mention this system of, of informal governance amongst the prisoners. So for the people who are at the top of this prison system, this self-governing prison system, they develop a certain reputation, they have a certain reputational capital that they can utilise. Basically, they have a reputation for being violent, for one thing, but also for knowing these informal norms very well and being able to adjudicate and, have, and adjudicate disputes. They also develop a sort of visual culture, so the tattooing, which is very famous in the, in the Soviet prison camps, and we, we sort of probably have seen, if you've seen Eastern Promises, the Cronenberg film, sort of the tattooing that we see. And there are certain like protected trademarks. So if you're an elite level prisoner, you're allowed to have certain types of tattoos and that communicates your status. And when you move prison camps, you take that status with you. Um, so this is the sort of system that once the Soviet Union collapses, still exists in all of these different former Soviet states. So if you go into prison, you're still dealing with a subculture that developed in the, in the gulag system within institutions that still look decidedly Soviet, i.e. they're still punishing collectively, they're still putting people in barracks rather than cells. So if we go from that, that's the problem for reformers, right? They, they look at this and they say, well, is this prison a subculture? And it's this subculture that governs the prison system, not the actual prison guards. And it's these guys that monopolize the violence and those are the guys that apply the violence in order to uh, manage this, um, this big system. Then you have a reform problem, which is how could we move away from an informal system of governance to actually give more power to formal structures, back to the guards. So reform, after the collapse of the Soviet Union is this big uh, policy issue. So what does reform look like? Basically what I want to say is firstly that prison reform is happening right across the region. It doesn't matter where you go, you can go to Kyrgyzstan, over to Estonia, down to Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and of course Russia. And you're gonna see lots and lots of policy activity around how you reform this system which has basically been bequeathed from the Soviet Union. Now, a key element of this is basically just to say, look, architecturally, we just need to get rid of these old Soviet camps. We need to get rid of the camp style. We, we need to move towards individualized cell-based punishment. So the key thing is a move to cells, so architectural reform. So I think this is put very nicely by the deputy general prosecutor, who is now the, is actually the general prosecutor now in Kazakhstan. I just think this is a nice statement of exactly what reformers are trying to achieve um, so basically, you know, uh, Asanov, this ge uh, deputy general prosecutor of Kazakhstan says, um, it is no less an important problem, dormitory, barrack confinement, 50 to 100 people in a room. It's exactly these conditions that served as the source of the prison subculture and its unwritten rules. There can be only one antidote, that's cell confinement. So this is a clear message of what reformers are trying to achieve. <laughs> And that message, you, you know, you could hear that from Kyrgyz reformers, you could hear that from Moldovan reformers, very, very similar ideas about what should happen. Usually it's architectural reform. So the idea is to move towards these cells. So this is occurring uh, right around the country. Now the puzzle for me was that I was observing some of these reform processes, which were all about trying to destroy the subculture by creating architecturally different conditions. And wherever I was observing attempts to do this, these reforms, what I was seeing was upticks in violence and upticks in riots, interpersonal violence, human rights abuses, which created a puzzle, uh, which actually American scholars have, have already, I, I went into the literature, I found American scholars have already de dealt with this quite extensively uh, when looking at American penal reform. But the, the idea is there's a paradox of reform. So you have a great idea, right? We want to improve these conditions. We want to reduce violence. We want to increase human rights, protections for human rights. And instead of that, what we actually see is this terrible uh, situation in which there's this paradox of reform where actually lots of violence is created by the reform itself. And I was very curious about how we explain that, right? So that leads me to like, the, basically the central puzzle, the central question. 
Um, so there's two questions, really. One is, how does reform impact these informal institutions that we might call this criminal subculture? Uh, and the social relations that exist among prisoners within colonies, i.e. prisons. So this is the big sort of question. Um, now the second question would be a more causal question, which is, you know, how do we explain the rise in violence and disturbances that follow the reform? So my idea was, my hypothesis was, that what really happens during these reforms is these informal institutions manage violence, they control conflict, they control the level of violence that's actually uh, within the system. And once you get a reform that comes in and intervenes in those institutions and intervenes in those um, informal rules, you actually destroy um, controls on things like conflict resolution and violence. You destroy solidarity and you interrupt information flow amongst prisoners, which is a really crucial element to this. So you ban something like tattooing, which is what they've done in Georgia, to try to stop this type of visual culture and communication. Uh, and this just creates status insecurity amongst people and people don't really know how to resolve disputes. So you end up with interpersonal violence, which are over status disputes, for example, because those statuses are no longer clear because the reform has muddied them. Uh, and you can also end up with uh, sort of collective violence, i.e. mass disturbances and riots. And we see that in, in a number of cases. And that, that's sort of the issue that I want to deal with today is really the issue around the collective violence and riots and disturbances and resistance to reform. OK, I'll say this next bit very, very quickly, because it could be a bit boring, uh, which is about the research design and the methods that I was using. <laughs> Um, to try to understand this issue around and whether basically this proposition about the interruption to informal institutions, its relation to, relationship to violence is holds or not. So I do a comparative case study. I think Marina already mentioned Georgia, Lithuania, Kyrgyzstan and Moldova. Uh, now, the reason I've chosen those is because they vary on the level of reform in each one. Now, that's the, the critical issue. I'm interested in variation in, in a, the amount of reform, which is the number of people held in cells rather than in barrack conditions, and then the relationship to, to violence and, and disturbances uh, in each case. So what we see, uh, just in case, I, I mean, maybe it's a bit silly because this, this, <laughs> this is about Foreign Relations Council, right? So you guys should know all this anyway. I don't need to put this slide up in terms of geography. I'm sure you know it all very well. Um, <laughs> but just in case you didn't, uh, my four cases are these, basically the idea was that they're all peripheral, right? And they're all in different sort of, you could say, uh, clear regions in the former Soviet uh, space. So Kyrgyzstan, down in the bottom there in Central Asia, Georgia, out there in South Caucasus, uh, Lithuania, out there in the Baltics, and Moldova, out there in what some people call New Europe, which I've never really understood. Okay, so uh, those areas uh, are all peripheral. They're, they're relatively similar size, right? So they make quite nice comparisons. They've got similar histories in the sense of the, the Soviet legacies. Um, and in each case, the level of reform is different. Um, so to give you an idea of that, Kyrgyzstan is one of my sort of zero cases where there's hardly any reform at all. And you can sort of see this by this picture of a Kyrgyz prison from outside. That's actually an operational prison. It doesn't look like one. Uh, but uh, that what is photographed there, it's not very clear. I'm sorry about that. It's taken from a bit of a distance because there are men with automated weapons stood on the perimeter fence. <laughs> um, but uh, this part is the sort of derelict old industrial zone. So in a Soviet period, colonies were divided into two zones, all part of the same space, contiguous space. So one was a living zone where people lived, and then you had an industrial zone where people would be pushed off to work and produce whatever materials they were producing for the Soviet economy. And so what you see here is actually a sort of derelict uh, industrial zone, which is pretty much not functioning anymore. And just to the right, you can start to see some barracks where people are actually living. And you've got a perimeter fence with people stood in towers uh, stopping escape. So if you compare that Kyrgyz case with uh, this, this is Georgia. This is a, a prison just outside Kutaisi in western Georgia. There's been a lot of reform in the prison system in Georgia. It's my highest reform case, basically. It's where you see the most reform. So here, this is a prison called Giguti, and they've moved basically the prisoners from the barrack system into cells of six people. So they used to live in 20, 30 to, into a cell, in a barrack, sorry, and now they're living like six people to a cell. So we see a great deal of variation is basically what I'm saying across the region. Um, so the, the, these are the key sort of issues I'm looking at. So Georgia's my high case, Lithuania's a medium case, then Kyrgyzstan's low, and, and Moldova is really the zero case where there's really been no 
um, reform in terms of trying to attack the prisoner subculture whatsoever. So in Kyrgyzstan, there have been a couple of things they've done, but Moldova is really uh, a nice baseline, if you like, because you can actually see what conditions are like before any reform is attempted. OK, again, very quickly, this bit's boring. I did a lot of a method, uh, for my methods, I did a lot of interviews um, with prisoners across the four cases. So it's already over 100, so we'll keep going and keep going. Um, usually recorded, um, in some cases inside the prisons, in some cases with ex-prisoners, depending on what sort of access I could get. And the idea is that I've got narratives there, so it's the same questions I ask every time. And it's about trust and social relations and, and violence uh, and conflict resolution. In each case, I just take the, the narratives, I start to compare across cases, and I look for themes, and I try to isolate the impact that reform is playing within the narratives about how people are resolving conflicts and how they're dealing with certain issues. Uh, so I, I compare across the cases in terms of the different narratives people are telling me uh, across the different countries, but then I also look across cohorts. So I have different people who are in the prison system at different times in one case. So in the Georgian case, before reform, during reform, after reform, and again, I compare within the case. Um, also includes staff interviews, expert interviews, and in Georgia and Moldova, we've been very lucky to be able to do sort of surveys amongst prisoners, representative surveys that actually ask particular questions about the presence of these, these what we might call prison gangs and informal structures. Okay, so that's the, the boring methods bit. Uh, this would be a very basic table that shows my sort of comparison. The key thing here is just again to note that Georgia is my high case, high amount of reform, Lithuania medium, Kyrgyzstan low, and, and Moldova also very low. And the key thing is here, how do, what do they do architecturally to try to attack this issue of informal structures and subculture? Usually it's about separation, right? And they're trying to remove the people who are high status, who might be the leaders of these sort of gang-like structures within the system. So in Georgia, the key thing was creating a separate prison where you put people who have this high level status from the gulag subculture. In Lithuania, what they do is they try to separate them out within the same prison. Uh, and in Kyrgyzstan, they also tried to attempt it, attempted to separate people into a separate prison. And that was really strongly resisted, which I'll go on to talk about. And in Moldova, no separation as such. So um, when this happens, this type of segregation, um, What's the reaction from the, the, the prisoners? So I, I said one of the key sort of analytical issues for me is to try to understand why do we see breakdowns of order? Why do we see riots? Why do we see resistance? Um, what would be going on there? So we have these prison-like gang structures within the system, yet when you try to attack them, prisoners often, you know, right across the penal estate will resist it and actually seem to riot on behalf of those criminal authorities as they're sort of known. Um, in the local languages. So one of the key questions is this. Uh, theoretically, what might we think about how we explain this? Uh, so taking the criminological theory from the United Kingdom, for example, usually when you look at prison riots and resistance, uh, you talk about legitimacy, the legitimacy of the regime, the formal regime within the prison, and its ability to produce compliance amongst prisoners. Um, and so in the UK, there was a lot of work on this when there was a lot of prison riots in the 1990s. They tried to understand what was going wrong in the system. And they basically, the central analytical concept was this issue of legitimacy. So the, if the prison isn't legitimate, people are more likely to resist uh, the regime that's imposed upon them. So there were three sort of ideas there that, that sort of frame this concept of legitimacy. So one is that the authorities, the formal prison guards, they conform to a set of rules and that those rules are actually justified by shared beliefs amongst the prisoners and the guards. So there's sort of a shared belief about what's reasonable punishment, what you could reasonably do to somebody, which leads to consent. So straight away, okay, if I'm trying to look at this in the former Soviet Union, what I'd do is try to take this theory and see, does it apply? And I think what we'll see is that maybe it does, but we have to make some qualifications about what's really going on there. Um, so this is, a, this is a theory around beliefs, right? This is a theory around sort of how people relate to the regime that's been imposed on them. There's also some very interesting literature uh, in the United States, um, recent literature by a scholar called David Scarbeck, um, who has a really great book about prison gangs in America, which I really would recommend reading. Um, now he comes at it, he's an economist, and he comes at it from a, 
an eco economic standpoint, and his idea is simply that, well, gangs produce a demand, uh, they, they fill a demand for governance. Where the formal structures can't produce governance, we see these gangs come and they fill it in, uh, and they help basically produce order in the system, and therefore we can understand why there'd be resistance, because they actually produce something like a public good for the prisoners. Um, so, he makes this type of claim, the rate of inmate homicides and prison riots have been declining since the 1970s in the United States, at the same time as gangs have proliferated. So we see this correlation between, a negative correlation where we see a reduction in violence at the same time as a growth in gangs. So again, this would be a starting point for me, right, in terms of trying to think about why you would see these riots in, in Georgia would be just take that, or Georgia or anywhere else, or take this, um, take this theory that it's, it's all about governance. So I try to produce some of my data now from each case, um, which suggests that some of these theories, they, they're not quite, they don't quite fit, um, but maybe to some degree, but we just need to qualify them. And again, maybe you can help me with some of that uh, in terms of trying to understand how good these theories are when you apply them outside of Western contexts. So the first issue I want to go to is that one, number one, Sparks' concept of legitimacy when he talks about authority's conformity to a set of rules. Now, in the Western literature, that's all about formal rules, right? That's all about the, what's, what's in the law itself. Um, so straight up, the first question would be, well, well whose rules are we talking about um, if we're talking about rules? Actually, the post-Soviet cases present a bit of a puzzle around this because what we see is collective resistance at times when prisoners are going to be moved to better prisons, <clears throat> which is curious, right? So two examples of this are two riots in Georgia, Kutaisi Prison Number 2 in December 2005, and Otachala Number 5 in March 2006. Now, these were really big riots. They spread across the pri prison estate. Um, and they were directly right before, I mean, we're talking literally, you know, a day or two before prisoners were due to be moved to these better facilities, actually facilities that have been open to European standards. That is like the Council of Europe going in and European Union going in and saying, yeah, you know, this is much better than what you had before in these Soviet, decrepit Soviet barracks. So there's a puzzle, right? I mean, why would, why would people riot and resist being moved to these better facilities? In the Western literature, it's assumed that when you improve conditions and you, you know, feed people better and you put them in better accommodation, the prison has more legitimacy and therefore you don't see as many riots. This doesn't work at all in, the, in this case in Georgia. So of course, what we need to ask is, uh, what are those rules then? Maybe it's not about the formal rules, but it's about the informal rules. Like, so how people, what expectations they already have about punishment might be nothing to do with what's laid out in the law, but just what's in the culture, for example, about what punishment should look like. Uh, maybe cell-based punishment is not as acceptable as uh, collectivist punishment, simply because in the cultural mindset of people, what they understand as punishment, um, one thing has more legitimacy than another. Uh, so one of the key issues here is the concept of a cell um, and what that actually means culturally in a country like Georgia compared to what it means in a country like America. Um, so in Georgia, the cell is not considered, you know, this place where you'd have more privacy and more security. Instead, it's associated with extra punishment. So the idea is that I'm living in my barrack, I'm happily walking around, I can leave the barrack whenever I like, I can talk to whoever I want, I've got this big space, I've got freedom, I've got autonomy. If you put me in a cell, I'm locked in, I can't do anything, the guard has a lot more control over me, this isn't so good for me. And when I'm put in a cell, it's usually because I have broken some sort of rule and so I'm segregated and I'm put in a cell. Or I'm pre-trial uh, and again, the conditions in the cells are much worse. So just the association with the cell perhaps explains why people might resist when they're being moved to supposedly better prisons. And as a, just as a more evidence of this idea that perhaps the culture of punishment is playing a role in terms of how people are resisting and pushing back against reform, um, is this, I've just picked a couple of quotes from a couple of interviews in Lithuania. In Lithuania, we had a sort of nice test of this idea because people actually would ask for transfers. So within the European Union, you could be transferred from one prison system to another at your own request. If you say, look, I committed a crime in, in England, but my family's in Lithuania, I want to be moved back to Lithuania. And what I actually found in the Lithuanian case was people wanted to be moved back to Lithuania, uh, but not because of family reasons or anything like that, but because they preferred 
the prisons of Lithuania um, and compared to other prisons, for example, in Estonia. So Estonia has pretty much Western style prisons now. It's, it's moved completely to that side where everybody's put in cells. So I'll give you a couple of quotes. One is from Gintaras, I've made up the name. Um, in Estonia, I was inside for two and a half years in a cell. It's enough. I asked to be moved here because this is a colony, right? Uh, I live here like I'm at home. Now I walk. I want to walk and walk and walk. It's freedom here. It is. I feel freedom. Uh, similarly, in um, Alitos, another prison in, in Lithuania, this is a quote from Jonas where he says, they don't want to manage us. No, they want to slowly put us in cells so they can control each person, close them in. If you take it away, though, we will riot, hunger strike, and so on in every camp and prison in Lithuania. So, you know... Uh, it's like, thank you, Jonas. You know, that's sort of like proving the, the, that sort of theory, right? Like that's when, when someone's quoted like that, they're saying, look, we will riot because of this. Um, okay, so straight away, when we're talking about legitimacy, we need to start asking about if it's rules, whose rules? What is, maybe it's the informal rules rather than the formal rules. If it's about shared beliefs, then what are those shared beliefs? They've got to be about, again, a culture of punishment that's very important. And then we start to understand what's legitimate and what's not. So legitimacy is really a very relative concept, right? So sure, like legitimacy maybe is an important explanatory concept here, but we have to sort of tweak it a little bit and, and rework it to make it sort of fit in the um, post-Soviet case. Moving on to the second idea, which was, well, these gangs, they sort of provide governance for people, so that's good, and therefore people would resist if you tried to take away the gang or remove them. Um, now, to test this idea, I've got a lot of data from Moldova, so I thought, again, we can quickly go through this, but the idea here is... In Moldova, we managed to do a survey, a representative survey, uh, with 683 prisoners, 242 staff. We did in-depth interviews with prisoners and focus groups with staff, and we used survey instruments that had been developed in America and the UK that really test for presence of gangs, like whether or not we can see a gang structure in place or not. Uh, so again, here the idea was, could we see where people were reporting that, yes, there was a high gang presence? Do we see a relationship with, between that and, for example, things like controls on violence? So the idea was, well, where people are saying, yes, there's lots of gangs here, they might also be saying, and the prison environment's better, and I'd feel more secure. That's basically what we were trying to get at. Because in the David Scarbeck thesis, the idea is in American prisons that gangs are actually producing security, reducing violence, and stopping riots. <coughs> Um, so that's what we were interested in there in Moldova. Um, I'm sorry, because it's not a great picture. It's just a like Google Maps. <laughs> I've just snapped it, a uh, screenshot. Um, it might not be very clear what, what's going on there. Uh, basically, it's a you know, overhead shot of a, of a prison in Krikova in Moldova where they make very, very good wine. Uh, and uh, yeah, Vladimir Putin had his birthday there once, apparently. Doesn't drink, he doesn't drink, no. Uh, it's a shame, I think. It's a missed opportunity. Um, so also in Krikova, there's a very, very big prison complex, uh, as well as a huge wine cellar. So you have, you have, two, um, you have two prisons. So this is a, it's the whole area of what used to be a, a Soviet zone. Um, now, what's interesting about this, that was one prison in the Soviet Union. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they divided it into two. So they just put up a wall and said, well, this will be one type of prison, this will be another one. And they're slightly different regimes. So one's a very closed prison, more controlled, and the other's a semi-open prison, as they call it. Um, now, what was interesting is that we see across that prison wall between the two prisons very, very different conditions and very, very different responses to our survey. Um, so in one prison, we see... They say the prison gang is, um, is highly present. There is lots of these sort of informal structures there. And in another prison, in number four, we see people reporting that there isn't a strong prison gang or a strong prison presence. So then we were interested, OK, what sort of correlations do we see um, across these two institutions in terms of people's security, feelings of security, in terms of the controls of violence and so on? Now, I'm really sorry again about some of these graphs that's not very well presented and you probably can't read that so maybe I'll just go through this very quickly. I mean this is this again is quite sort of fresh data so I'm just throwing up graphs that we made. I haven't really you know tried to make it look nice or sorry about that. Um, I did use different colours though at least <laughs> uh, so we can sort of see differences. Um, but here 
basically the idea is you're asked, do you agree or disagree? And you've got a number of questions that all try to test the presence of prison gangs in these different institutions in, in uh, Moldova. So one question is, do prison leaders exist? Do the prison leaders decide positions in the caste system? That's the hierarchy system that they have. Are violations always punished? Are the punishments clear? And do you have to have permission to punish, i.e. to use violence against a fellow inmate? So all that's trying to test, basically, is the presence of the prison gang and the degree to which they centralise and monopolise the violence production. Uh, basically, what you can see from this graph is, uh, in crick of a 15, um, the closer to one it is, i.e. the lower that bar is, the more people are saying they see a prison gang. So you can see there's a big difference, basically. In Crick of a 15, people are much closer to one, i.e. they're strongly agreeing that there are these things present in their prison. The blue is Crick of a number four, where people are basically more disagreeing or strongly disagreeing that these things actually exist in their prison. So that shows you we do have variation across the, the, the system in Moldova. But then when we also look at this correlation with violence and security, we saw a very, very clear uh, correlation. Again, I'm not really sure whether this table will make any sense, but I'll try to talk you through it a little bit. So the question was basically a statement. There is quite a lot of threats and bullying in here, in this prison. And people could agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And basically we just did a cross tabulation where with the question, there are leaders in this prison who enforce the prisoners' rules. Basically, what we kept seeing was a relationship between where people were saying that they agreed that there were prisoners in here that enforced the prisoners' rules, that they punish, they monopolize, you have to ask for permission if you want to use violence, and so on and so forth. We saw a strong correlation between that and people saying, there are a lot of threats and bullying in here, I feel insecure in this prison, um, you know, there's a lot of corruption in this prison, uh, and things like, you know, even things like, um, you know, pe there's a lot of drugs, people are doing a lot of drugs in this prison. Uh, there's antisocial behaviour, people spitting on the floor, people littering, so we're just looking at general prison environment. So the idea was the Moldovan survey seemed to be suggesting something very different from what the theory, the American theory about prison gangs seemed to be suggesting. Um, so the key here really was that the data seemed to be showing that this isn't about good governance. I mean, actually, where the prison gangs exist, we seem to see very, very bad informal governance, bad conditions, lots of insecurity, lots of um, threats and bullying and violence. And this was true also in the staff service. So the staff would say that they felt that they were disrespected, that they'd been um, either threatened or victimised if they also were saying that there was a high presence of, of gang culture in their prison. So this seems to, again, strongly indicate that we couldn't really make this con conclusion, right, that you can say, well, people resist these reforms because these gangs really do something good for these prisoners. In the Moldovan case, at least, it just doesn't, it doesn't look like that. So I, I want to now move to, okay, where have we got to? We've got to the point where we can say beliefs and legitimacy are sort of important, but we need, again, we need to rethink those. And then this issue around governance is a difficult one because we, if we think about this in terms of like maybe positive incentives to support this informal system, um, we don't, we can't really see that, not from the Moldovan case at least. Perhaps there are negative incentives, if you see what I mean, to support this system, i.e. people are just very scared that if they don't support this system, if they don't pay money into this communal fund every month, if they don't support a riot, if they don't go on hunger strike, something bad could happen to them. Um, and to sort of try to maybe flesh out that idea a little bit more, I'm just going to give a few more examples of prison riots that occurred at the same time as reform. I'm going to concentrate particularly on Kyrgyzstan, where you see really, really massive resistance to reform. Um, and I think that what I'll try to show is that that's a plausible hypothesis, that it's really about fear and, and a sense of, like, if you don't support this, what might happen to you? By actually showing the reach of how these gangs operate within this very sort of open system. Um, so particularly, I'll actually try to look at like the organizational logistics of a prison riot um, in Kyrgyzstan. Okay, um, so Kyrgyzstan 2005, there was a huge prison riot that swept right across the system. That was partly to do with trying to remove one convict, one prisoner, uh, and put him in a different uh, institution. And his name was Aziz Batukaev. Um, they tried to reduce his influence. There was a huge riot. Uh, the riot just continued. All the staff left the prison. Uh, and to try to calm the riot, a parliamentarian and 
the head of the prison service went in to this place where the riot had begun and they were actually taken prisoner and then executed by the prisoners. So there was a really sort of serious resistance basically to this man being removed from the prison that he was in. Within that prison, this guy had the status, this elite status of thief in law, which is the highest status in the criminal elite within the prison subculture. He had the tattoos um, and inside the prison, he kept horses. He grew marijuana. <laughs> this is Kyrgyzstan where horses are, really have a you know, high symbolic sort of value. Uh, he, so he grew marijuana. He had an entire wing that was just for himself. And he pretty much controlled the colony, right? The, the, the guards did not control that colony. And when they tried to move him, all the prisoners rose up in support of him and it went outside that prison. And you can see the incredible violence that was also used where they had more guns inside the prison than the actual staff coming in to try to control that situation. Um, so in such a situation, again, if we're talking about fear, if you think, well, they, they just executed the head of the prison service, you know, you could imagine the fear that might actually exist just amongst the ordinary prisoners. Um, this is a picture, actually, of that man, Aziz Batulkaev. Uh, he's an ethnic Chechen, he's born just outside Bishkek, uh, the capital city of Kyrgyzstan. That's him sort of just kneeling in the center. They're on top of the roof of a prison there, which sort of gives you a sense of like just how free the, the movement is, people just wandering around, taking photographs, you know. Um, so that's him right in the center. Um, prison roof, I'm sort of playing on the words, <laughs> like so the roof in Russian is like a protection racket. Right? So um, a prison roof in Kyrgyzstan, there they are on top of that roof. Uh, Aziz Batukov is quite an interesting guy. He was actually grew up in the same community as the Sarnev brothers who bombed the, the Boston Marathon. Um, okay, so this is an example of like really extreme violence that occurred during one of these prison riots. Just to give you a sense of, you know, I mean, again, I, I'm glad everyone's finished eating. Um, in Moldova, looking at juvenile detention and riots, often you see um, resistance to attempts to reform the juvenile in, uh, institutions. And there's some very clear instances of this. In Goyan, number 10, that's in Moldova, there were three riots between 2015 and 2017. And this was basically because the, the governor was trying to separate out the young prisoners who wanted to be thieves in law, who wanted to be these elite level mafiosi and guys that didn't. And this actually, again, generated protests and riots within the institution. Um, similarly in Tbilisi, a similar situation in 2012 where they tried to remove a guy who was claiming to be a criminal authority, like a mafiosi guy. Now, one of the key issues there is that self-harm is very, very prevalent in the riots. So the violence also turns inward onto the individual themselves. And again, in the interviews, we've seen very clear statements by both staff and people involved in the riots that said they, they self-harmed as a rational sort of way of signaling their commitment to the subculture. I mean, basically the idea is I'm willing to impose such a huge cost on myself, you know, I would sew my lips together, I would cut myself. That shows real commitment that I, I want to be within this subculture, I want to work within it, I want to be a high status prisoner. Um, and what was happening there was that these guys are going to leave the juvenile detention center at some point and they're going to go into adult prison. And when they go into adult prison, they want to have those scars, they want to have those uh, actual, like, real evidence of their commitment to the, the, the prison subculture. So again, if we think about these incentives around what's happening there, again, we, we'd assume that the ability to be punished or the, the fear of being put in a lower caste is so extreme that people are actually willing to self-harm in order to do this. So again, that sort of seems to suggest that this incentive to actually, you know, the fear incentive might be quite strong. Um, going back then to Kyrgyzstan, there was another huge riot in 20, um, uh, 2012, 2011, 2012, um, just on the cusp there, December, January. At that particular point, there was an interim government in Kyrgyzstan that was very reformist, and they were putting forward all these ideas about reforming the prison system in Kyrgyzstan. And basically, they'd separated out a separate prison for organized criminals and mafia bosses, uh, colony number 50. Now, they tried to, again, move one of the prison leaders, one of these high-status prisoners, from one of the prisons in Bishkek out to this colony number 50. So they tried to move them from the remand centre, actually, the pretrial detention centre, to colony number 50. And this started a huge riot right across the prison system. And they also tried to attempt to stop Chod, which is basically from Hadith, which is um, people's ability just to walk and move around the prison freely. 
without any keys. So in, in the Kyrgyz Remand Center, in the pretrial detention center, you actually had some prisoners who had keys, they could just go to any cell they wanted to. Um, and they tried to stop that. And by doing that, there was, a, again, a huge wave of protest, a huge resistance. And again, self-mutilation was involved. People so, sewed their lips together. Um, and so there was a, like a, real, a really strong reaction to it. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand like, why people would go to these lengths. Um, I, I was looking a little bit at the power and the influence of these criminal bosses to really punish people who don't support this informal system of governance. And that was the key thing to me. So very quickly, and I think um, this is like sort of the final empirical point I'm going to make, I'm just going to talk very quickly about this sort of organisational logistics of, of a prison riot. Um, so this is from Kyrgyzstan. So thinking about that sort of wave of, of riots that came right through. Yes, I'll be very quick then. Um, so that's Kyrgyzstan. Um, you, so you've got to think about the penal geography. Sorry, I'm going to move away from the microphone. Um, this is Bishkek, the capital city. Uh, and this is a, an oblast, the Chushkai oblast, which is the sort of main area of the, the country that's got the biggest population and so on. Now, the key thing to know about this is that all of the colonies, all of the prisons, so there's 11 colonies and 10 of them are in that oblast, within that oblast. Only one is down here in the south in Jalalabad. So again, the penal geography is very concentrated just in one area of the country. And you can see a train line that goes through the Karabal Tabish Kek Um Now, if you just keep that in mind, right, just that sort of, that image of Kyrgyzstan there. Um, and I'll just zoom in to Chuskai Oblast, and you'll see the location of the uh, penal colonies. So there it is. So that's like the majority of your penal colonies right there, all concentrated around the capital city. And you could also sort of draw a line of best fit that would follow along the train line, right, which was intentional. So in the Soviet period, it was all about moving materials. So there was this, all the, all the prisons sort of positioned along the train line. Um, now, the key thing here is that if you want to punish somebody for not supporting your particular issue or your riot, um, information was flowing very easily amongst these different prisons before mobile phones, and of course mobile phones just make it worse. But even in the Soviet Union, you had practices of information transmission which were crucial to the spread of the subculture and crucial to the spread of the informal institutions. So in this particular area, you could imagine all this information flowing between these different institutions, telling people who's doing what, what position they are, where they are in the caste hierarchy, are they supporting the leaders, are they not, are they resisting, are they giving information to the, the formal authorities, the governors, or not, if they are, they should be punished, and so on, and then being able to actually enact the punishment, right? So it's critical to an informal uh, system of governance that you have the rules, and then you also have rules about what happens if you break those rules, and then you're able to actually perform the practices of punishment uh, for breaking the rules. So the key thing here is about information flow. That's basically what I want to say. Um, the key thing here really is about your ability to you know, push. For example, if we're having a riot here, we can cause a riot in other places. And it's really about the, the joined upness of some of these colonies, which is coming from the Soviet system, right? which is coming from all these practices to actually generate information and move it around. So the key thing here that I just want to emphasize is where those, where those riots start is usually the remand center. It's usually the place, that, and usually those are in the capital cities. So why the Raman Center? So the Raman, Raman Center in, in the Kyrgyz case, it's this number one in Bishkek, right, right in the capital city. And my claim would be basically that the Raman Center plays an incredibly important role in how you control information and control influence in the system, because people pass through Raman Centers all the time. So firstly, it's when you come into the prison system and you're gonna be defined and put into a particular caste that happens in the remand centre. But also, if someone's got a court date, they'll be put into the remand centre, and then they'll be sent back to the prison. And this coming and going constantly enables sort of information to flow. So what we see is these remand centres being incredibly important places uh, for understanding the spread and the influence of these criminal subcultures on just everyday commoner garden prisoners. Um, so in Kyrgyzstan, it's prison number one, and that's why we might see that riot occurring. But in each case, we see really um, real importance put on these different types of institutions. So uh, Georgia is one, Ortachala, number five. That's where the, the riot, one of those big riots began. Kisinau, number 13 in Moldova. 
These are the really key places, and governments try to control them, right? Because when they're making the reform, they really try to control the remote centre. OK, I'm done. Um, <laughs> that was the picture, I think, that you used to advertise it. Um, just very quickly, the reason I've put those pictures up is that these are, these are the reformed remand centres. This is what it sort of looked like in Moldova before reform. This is what it's supposed to look like in a few years. And this is the Georgian remand centre, where they, they sort of built a new remand centre according to sort of American model. So it sort of ties in with the picture. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Question number one. Are orthodox icons used by prisoners as tattoos? And if so, do different icons communicate different things? Should I answer? Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I'm no expert on tattooing. Uh, I've thought about getting my own tattoos, but it would probably just be like mum or something like that. Um, <laughs> There are, there are encyclopedias of tattoos with the meanings which I could recommend if somebody wanted to look into it. The short answer is yes, there's a heavy, um, there's, a, there's a high prevalence of religious symbolism uh, in the tattooing in the prisoner subculture, which makes a lot of sense uh, if you think about it. Um, particularly from a perspective of reputation amongst these, some of these mafiosi, right? If you believe what I've just said, which is that in Moldova they don't really produce any good governance whatsoever, it's very important to assuage people's problems and fears by saying, you know, we're men of honour, we're people who are sort of saintly or holy. So having these religious tattoos could be seen as a very practical way of increasing and enhancing reputation for institutions that don't really produce anything good for prisoners whatsoever. So I would suggest that. If you actually go in Moldova and in Georgia, they built churches, the prisoners themselves built churches within the colony. And what you actually see is a very interesting thing where you'll, you can go into the church and you'll see all the usual Orthodox icons and so on. And on, if you look on the floor, I've seen it in two cases now, there, are, there is this black and white star, which is the symbol of the elite level prisoners, the caste. So there's a intertwining of the religious Im imagery with the elite caste, yeah. I Thank you. Question number two. Did the criminal elite respond to the survey questions differently or the same as lower status criminals? In other words, did they experience and evaluate the prison culture as more fair and more safe? That's a very interesting question. Now, unfortunately, in the survey, we don't ask people, you know, what is your status? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can't really um, say we're not able to delineate that. It would be very, very interesting. Again, I would expect that, that oh, the higher level prisoners would say that, that they you know, they think everything's... We did try to manage the questions so that it didn't look like we were actually asking about subculture. And we didn't ask about specific instances of victimisation, because, I mean, that could be very difficult for some prisoners. So it was more about your general perceptions, your feelings of security. Um, what does prison reform look like in unrecognised states within the former USSR, such as Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, Transnistria, etc.? Uh, that's a great question. That should be somebody's PhD. <laughs> um, would solitary confinement in remand centers effectively interrupt the flow of information? Um, this is one of the big issues. The answer, I think, is probably no. And I think you'd base that on studies of what happens in American prisons, where you have, you know, supermax prisons that where gang leaders are com supposedly completely isolated. And what we know is that information still leaks out from those places. What you have here is a, a human variable, which is that, uh, particularly in high corruption cases, um, it's quite easy to get information out, even if you're solitary confined. I think there's a real danger as well of saying, we want to reform these prisons, what's the best way to do it? Let's just go in as harsh as we can and like create solitary confinement, which I think is probably not a good idea. I, I think that's, it's not going to work for one thing, and secondly, it's going to create lots of human rights abuses in these types of countries where human rights protections are not really strongly embedded or built in. Mm -hmm. So this is a more general question. What is the focus of the prisons? Is it punishment and warehousing, or rehabilitation and preparation for re-entry into society as responsible citizens? Um, I think if you ask prison governors that question, the, you know what their response would be. Um, it's all about rehabilitation, of course. And uh, Clearly, what you have in the former Soviet Union is a case of warehousing. So in the Soviet period, it was about political economy. So this was about having a sort of a labour force there, which you could force to do all sorts of jobs. Now we see these industrial zones are pretty much collapsed and labour is not something you impose on somebody, they have to choose to work. So that sort of rationale is gone. You still see these very long sentences, so the, the region still has some of the highest prison rates in the world, which to my mind looks like warehousing. Mm 
uh, and they don't have the money again for rehab and things like that. Um, yeah. And are there women's prisons in the system? And um, are they, um, do they operate in a similar way? I'm sorry if I'm not understanding the handwriting exactly, but that's the idea. <laughs> yes, the women's prisons are really, really interesting. Although I'm sorry to say that I didn't do um, a lot of research on the, the women's prisons. They mainly focus on the male prisons, but in the Moldovan case, we do have a lot of data on the women's prisons. And I was able to go into the women's prison in Moldova and talk there. Uh, what's quite interesting is that you do see a sort of mirroring of the, the, the male prison subculture, so in terms of hierarchies and castes. But in the Moldovan case, that has been weakened a great deal by a reform effort. And that's very interesting. I often felt that in the Moldovan case, you could actually take the women's prison as an example as a model of, of how you might actually go about this type of reform because they've not done anything too radical it's just some very basic things which involve improving trust between the guards and the women mm -hmm. which i think is maybe a baseline so forget about the architecture forget about trying to you know just destroy everything and build again think about interpersonal relations so women's prisons are really useful sites of of research mm -hmm. on this issue, yeah, definitely. And the final question, and apologies for not getting to all of them, is um, I assume that not all prisoners have committed equally serious offenses, right? So how does this affect where prisoners live and how they live? Um, and I guess I would like to add, like, how does it affect the dynamics that you specifically investigate in your research? Uh, yes, I mean, the crime type is quite interesting. So again, if you think about the racialization of gangs in America, right? So they, they tend to be divided by race. That isn't the case in the former Soviet Union. So you can be Uzbek or Kazakh or Russian and still have one of these high status and still be a boss. You can be a Chechen like the guy in the Kyrgyz case that we saw. So the way they divide up is mainly more by crime type. It's mainly more by, as in the Soviet period, those people who did political crimes and those people who did more socially close crimes to the regime. So common thieves and so on have more status. Um, so there is a sort of division based on that, but they sort of inform. The, but the way they end up being organised spatially is quite informal. So when you go into the quarantine, that's the reception unit inside the prison. In these unreformed prisons, you will be met by one of the criminal leaders who will ask you certain questions, and the guards will also ask you certain questions, which are informal questions. I mean, about basically they ask you, who are you in life? Like, how do you live your life? Which means, and who can you sit with? That's another question they ask. And that basically, if you say I can sit with anyone, then that means you're high status. I mean, you, you're able to, to be with anyone. Um, so we now conclude our program. Uh, why don't we uh, give a big thank you to Dr. Gavin Slade for his presentation. Uh, let me thank also once again our sponsors, University of Iowa International Programs, University of Iowa's Honors Program, the U of I Public Policy Center, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. Thanks also to today's special sponsors, John Menninger and Mike Carberry. And thanks also to City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. Uh, Gavin, as a small token of our appreciation, we present you with what we like to call the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're adjourned.